Recording in progress. Morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Well, it's a good Monday, isn't it? An all right Monday. It's an all right. I was a little disappointed this morning because I uh, last week I've been saying like it's going to rain this week because I looked at the weather forecast last week and it said indeed like rain Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then I looked this morning and there was no rain and none for the next two weeks. So, I don't know. I think maybe winter is over for us. We had all that rain in December and then nothing. What do you think? I'm just sad about the lack of snow. Can't go snowboarding or anything. There's no snow? Well, it's, it's starting to be a, dr- a downtrend as the snow starts to melt <laughs> oh yeah it, uh, I mean there's still snow up there I can see it in the mountains but um, yeah I'll be all starting to get all hard on the top and yeah it's, it's better when it's all powdery yeah I don't know we can hope out for the hope we can hope for the last half of February and maybe some of March but you know December and January is supposed to be the wettest months and January was pretty much a, a no show for rain Well, here we are in week number two. Hopefully you've got your classes all straightened out. You've added all the ones that you want to take. Got out of the ones you don't want to take. Did anybody use these first two weeks to kind of shop around? Go into classes that you think you might like and then check them out for the first week. And then if you don't like them, just take off, do something else. But it gets full if you're already like trying to add like super late. No, that's true. But I think some people maybe overextend themselves. They uh, sign up for more units than they can take with the intention of dropping at least one or two of them. At least that's what I did when I was in college. <laughs> you know, would sign up for 20 units and then drop one of them when I went, ah, I don't really want to take this one yet. Well, this week we are starting um, like chapter two or something like that. I actually forget what chapter this is. But last time we talked about how to represent information using just numbers. We talked about how to represent um, uh, like taking binary data, like image data, and turning that into just a textual representation using base 64. We also learned about how to um, convert decimal to binary and hexadecimal and these other bases. So that's basically just representing whole numbers using uh, binary and these other representations. 
What we're going to talk about today is how do we now layer things like negative numbers on top of that. The key thing here is all we have are ones and zeros. When we're doing a numeric representation using like the, the, the ones that we do, the ones we've historically been doing for hundreds or thousands of years, if you just want to do a negative number, you just put a little dash in front of the number. So we have an extra symbol for representing negative numbers or the fact that a number is negative. But what do we do in binary when all we have are just ones and zeros? So I'm going to start you off with a question, a couple of questions. Let me get things switched over here in just a moment. So how many different values can you represent in just four bits? So don't worry about negatives at this point. Just how many different values can you represent in four bits? And to help you calculate this, remember there can be either a one or a zero in that first spot. There could be a one or a zero in that second spot, a one or a zero in the third, and a one or a zero in the fourth. So how many total values can we represent? 16. 16, good. And we can get that by doing 2 to the 4th power is 16. So 2 possibilities here, 2 here, 2 here, and 2 here. That gives us a total of 16. So what's the range of values? What's the smallest value we can represent, and what's the biggest value? 0 to 15. Good. 0 to 15, which gives us a total of 16 possible values. How about 10 bits? How many possible values can we do? 1024. Good. 1024, which is 2 to the 10th. And the range goes from 0 to... 123. 1023. So in general, for an unknown number of bits, n bits, how many possible values can we do? Two to the n. Mm -hmm. Good. Two to the n. And the range would be zero to... N Two to the n minus one. one. Good. Two to the n minus one. So keep that in mind, that for a certain number of bits, you can calculate how many possible values you can represent and what are the range of values. So uh, these are the whole numbers. For four bits, we can go 0 to 15. <clears throat> but if we want to start doing negative numbers, then we need to take some of those positive numbers and reassign them to be negative numbers. So we've got a total of 15 value or 16 values for four, uh, for four bits. So some of those will become negative numbers, and some of them will remain positive numbers, and there's different ways of doing that. So your textbook talks about a technique called two's complement, and this is the most common way of doing it these days. There's also sine magnitude, which is actually very similar to the way we humans do it. And then I'm also going to show you one called XSN. It goes by other names, XSK and bias. So I think, uh, now two's complement is definitely in the textbook. I think sine magnitude is in there, but these, this other one, XSN, is not in the textbook. But it's important to know because we'll need that uh, later on. So one of the questions that you had to answer on the quiz, if you took it before today, is what is this number? Uh, assuming that it's a Two's complement number. So the first thing you might want to know is, is this number positive or negative? And this number is negative. If you look at the most significant bit, which could also be interpreted as the sine bit, 0 is positive and 1 is negative. Since we know this number is negative, 
we can't just simply look at the place values of the remaining bits and obtain the number. What we have to do is what the book shows you, which is uh, called the invert and add method. So you take all the bits, you flip them, one becomes zero, zero becomes one, then you add one to that number, and then that becomes the negation of the number that you just were looking at. So we're gonna, in order to figure out what this number is, what we're gonna have to do is turn this into a positive number, then we can read off the value, and then we know what the negative number was. So we're gonna take the negative number, make it positive, read off the number, and then that means the original number was the negative of that number. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go uh, one, and then five zeros, and then one zero. We're going to invert. So I just flipped all the bits, then add one to that number. And adding in binary is a lot like adding in base 10, except that you only have ones and zeros, and you're going to carry more often. So we're going to do 1 plus 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, but in binary, that's 1, 0. So we're going to write down the 0 and carry the 1. Then we're doing 1 plus 0, which is 1. And then the rest of the bits are the same, because there's no carry. And then we just convert this to decimal. We do that by writing out the powers of 2. It's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. Then we'll just add up the places where there's just a 1 there. 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2. And uh, I think we end up there with 126. <clears throat> so... If this number is 126, it means that the original number must have been negative 126. So in two's complement, when you do this invert and add, all you're doing is taking a number and you're calculating the negation of it, the negative of it. <clears throat> so if the number was positive, flipping an add will make it negative. <clears throat> and if the number was negative, flipping an add will make it positive. So I think one thing that's confusing for people that are first learning about two's complement um, is to think that doing the flip and add is just the way to make a number negative or just a num way to make a number positive. But really, what it's doing is it's taking any number, whether it's negative or positive, and then just switching the sign, essentially. You're cha changing the positive to a negative or the negative to a positive. It's the exact same operation, the exact same sequence of steps for both. So let's do a little bit of arithmetic in binary. <clears throat> Again, don't worry about positives or negatives here. Just simply uh, add or subtract these numbers as appropriate. So the first three numbers are addition, and the fourth number is subtraction. I want you to go ahead and take a moment to do those. Just write them down on a piece of paper and try to calculate what the answer is. Just come up with the answer in binary. Remember, when you're adding in binary, it's a lot like adding in base 10. You're still going to add column-wise from the right, like you did in grade school. And then if the number carries, which means to get a sum of two or more, then you're just simply going to write down the ones digit in that column and then carry over the next bit in the next column. So try to do those. For number four, um, you're going to have to probably borrow from columns just like you did in base 10, but this time you're going to do it in base 2. So
So instead of borrowing 10 from the previous column, or not the previous, the next column, you're going to borrow 2 from it. So give those a whirl. Try to figure out what the answers are. Maybe post them in the chat when you've got an answer for each one, and then we'll see how you do. All right, Max has got an answer, and it's matching up with other people's answers, so that's good. So that's, an, <clears throat> that's the answer for number one. And then number two, let me see how we're doing there. Yep, I think people are doing pretty good so far. Number three, I'm just looking at the chat answers here right now, so I'll, I'll put them on the screen in just a moment. Uh, number three... Uh, not quite right. The, um, we are doing all these calculations in six bits. So maybe assume that our computer, for whatever reason, can only hold answers in six bits. There we go. That's better for number three. And number four doesn't quite match my answers, so maybe look at that one again. <clears throat> so let's go over these. So I saw that people had posted, oh, let me scroll back here. We have posted one, zero, zero, 011 one for number one, and that is correct. Let me go ahead and do this as though we didn't know what the answer was. So I'm going to start on the uh, right hand side. Zero plus one is one, and then one plus zero is one. One plus one is two, but in binary that's one zero. So we're going to put the zero down and carry the one. Then 1 plus 0 plus 1 is also 2, so we'll write down 0 and carry the 1. And then 1 plus 1 plus 0 is also 2, so we'll write down 0 and carry the 1. And then finally, 1 plus 0 plus 0 is just 1. And we could also verify this answer by just converting the base 10 and making sure we got the right answer. So this first number here is, let's see, this is... Um, 2 plus 4 plus 16, which is 22. And this number here is 1 plus 4 plus 8, which is 13. Add those together, we get 5 and 3, we get 35. And then we'll just make sure that this answer is 35. So we've got 1, 2, and 32. And that adds up to 32, 35 as well. So <coughs> double check. We got the answer correct there. Let's do number two. Start from the right hand side. One plus zero is one. One plus one is zero. Carry the one. One plus one plus one is three. Three in binary is one one. So write down the 1 and carry the 1. 1 plus 0 plus zero, uh, 1 is 2. So that's a 0, carry the 1. This is a 1, and this is a 1. <coughs> so you see the way you do the arithmetic in binary is very similar to doing in base 10, but you're just dealing with 1s and zeros. Okay, the next one gave people a little bit of confusion. Let's try this one. So 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. And then 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. 
and then 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1, 1. But since our answer is only going to be 6 bits wide, we're going to keep the right hand 6 bits and then just throw away the one that's left over. Or if you've taken the assembly language class, the computer architecture class, you might know that this one actually appears as either the carry flag or the overflow flag. They kind of same, have the same purpose uh, in one of the register, uh, the status registers. But really, the answer is in that lower six bits. You just throw away any remaining bits, and uh, this is your answer here. So uh, let's just double check what we got. So this is 1 plus 4 plus 16 plus 32, which is 53. And then the bottom number is 1 plus, uh, 1 plus 8 plus 16 plus 32, which is uh, 40, 57. And if we add these together, we get 110 in base 10. which is the number we would have gotten if we had kept all the bits here, all seven bits, but we only kept six bits. This number is 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 32. Let's see, that's 40, 40, 46. So the real problem we just did is 53 plus 57 equals 46. Seems a little strange. What happened to the 110? Well, in, in this particular representation system where we're only using six bits, the number 110 simply does not exist. And that's because the range of values we can do with six bits is 0 to 63. So 110 follows, falls outside that range, and so it just is a number that's nonsensical. This is going to come back to, we're going to revisit this idea that there's a, a range of numbers that we can represent, and if a number falls outside of that range, it just simply doesn't exist. Last one, subtraction. Do it just like you did in grade school. Zero minus one, um, say that again. One minus one is zero. One minus one, zero. Okay, zero minus one, we can't do that, so we have to borrow from the next column. And the way we're gonna borrow is just like we did in grade school. We're going to lower this number by 1, so this becomes 0. And then that 1 is going to pop over into the previous column and become, well, in binary, base 10, which is really the number 2. And now we can do this. 2 minus 1, or 10 minus 1 in, in binary, is 1, and then we've got 0 minus 0, 0. <coughs> Next column, 0 minus 0, 0, and then 1 minus 0 is 1. And then we can double check our answers. This is 1 plus 2 plus 8 plus 32, which is 43. And the bottom number is 7. We're subtracting. 43 minus 7 is 36. And if we just double check this, this is um, 1 plus 2 plus, this is 4, and this is 32. 32 plus 4 is 36. Okay, let's, let's do some more of those.
This is four bit arithmetic. Previous slide was six bits. Now we're going to do just four. We've got a kind of a mixture of subtraction and addition. So try to do these. Oh, you all are fast. Coming up with the answers already. But I don't think that's the right answer for number one. I'm comparing my notes to what's in the chat over here. That's why my head's going back and forth. Um, number two, that, num, that's correct. And now, Max, your number one is correct. Oh, we've got some differing answers for number three. Number four is also being a little bit of a challenge. My eight-year-old is here. He's sick today. And he just snuck in, grabbed the cough drop. Oh, there we go. Now your number four is better. Okay, let's take a look at these. So the first one is subtraction. Start from the right. 1 minus 0 is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 minus 1. Can't do it, so we got to borrow. This becomes 0, and this becomes 10, which is really just 2. Sorry, he just, he just brought me a drink because <laughs> my, my voice is going for some reason. Um, uh, where were we? Oh, oh, 2 minus 1 is 1, and then 0 minus 0 is 0. And then just to double check, this number at the top is 11, and the number down below is 6. We're subtracting, and we get 5, and that's what this number is. And then, um, let's see, this next problem here. We've got 0 minus 1 on the right-hand side. Can't do that, so we have to borrow. This becomes 10, which is really 2. Oh, no, sorry. 
this becomes 0, and this one becomes 10, which is really 2. And now we can do this. We got 2 minus 1 is 1. And we have now 0 minus 1, so we're going to have to borrow from the next column. This becomes 0, and this becomes 10, which is really 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. And then 0 minus 0 is 0. And now we've got a problem here. We've got this 0 minus 1, and we have to borrow from the next column. But there isn't a next column, so we'll cheat a little bit. We'll pretend, let's pretend there's one that we can borrow from over there. Now we get 2 minus 1 is 1. Okay, and let's just double check our answers. The top one is 6, the bottom one is 11, and we're subtracting, and we end up with 11, which seems uh, a little strange, but maybe it's because we're only dealing with 4 bits. So let's, let's press on anyway. Number 3, we're adding 0 plus 1 is 1. Uh, 0 plus 1 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, and then 1 plus 0 is 1. The top number is 9, and the bottom number is 6. We're adding those together, and we get 15, and 15 is what 4 ones is. So that, that one's all good. And then finally, number 4, this is also addition. We're doing 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1, and then 1 plus 1 plus 0 is also 0, carry the 1, and then we're just going to keep these four bits and throw this one away. So we get 14 plus 5 appears to be 3. And just like before, that's an artifact of having only four bits in our answer. Really, the answer is like uh, 19, um, but we threw away that, that bit that represents the 16, and so we end up with just three as our answer. So let's kind of uh, peel back the covers on this and try to figure out, like, what's going on? Why do we get some of these nonsensical answers? And I did say it was kind of related to being, there being only four bits, but what's really happening? And it helps to picture the four bits, not on a number line like we're used to, but actually on a wheel. So here's zero at the top, and then it increases going around the circle until it gets to 15, and then it just kind of rolls over and goes back to zero. It's kind of like the um, old-fashioned odometers in a car that actually had the dials that turned. That Once you got to like all nines, you roll over and you just go back to zero again. Probably never seen an odometer do that. Not only because these days we have digital uh, odometers in our car, but also they usually put in enough digits so that you don't get a rollover. But, uh, you know, back when I was growing up, the cars often only had five digits on the odometer, and so if you kept your car long enough, it would roll over, and you get all zeros. So then you can sell your 10-year-old car as though it was new. <laughs> but anyway... Let's do, on this wheel, some of the problems that we just did on the previous page over here. One of the problems we did was 9 plus 6. So here's how you do it on the wheel. You find your 9, which is right here, and then to add 6, you just keep going around the wheel in a clockwise direction. So we'll start at 9, and we'll add 6 by just bouncing along the wheel. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We end up at 15, and so we know that 9 plus 6 is 15.
Let's try 11 minus 6. So we'll start at 11. To subtract, we just go in the other direction around the wheel. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we end up at 5. Here's one of the other problems we did. 14 plus 5. We calculated that we end up at 3. Let's see if that happens. So we'll start at 14, and we'll add 5 by going clockwise. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And look at that. We ended up at 3. So on this wheel, 14 plus 5 is indeed equal to 3. Then one of the other problems we did was 6 minus 11. I think that was um, this one right here. Six minus eleven. So we'll start at six, and we'll just subtract eleven by going in the other direction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and so we end up at eleven. So now you understand why we ended up with some of those weird answers that we did on the previous page. When we're only doing four bits, it's kind of like they're on a wheel, and so when you go past 15, you end up at zero, and when you go the other direction, when you go past zero, you end up back at 15. So let's do another problem. Nine minus five. All right, that's easy. Start at nine. We're subtracting, so we go uh, around the wheel the other way. One, two, three, four, five. And we end up at four. So here's two more to do. What's two minus five and zero minus five? Go ahead and look at the wheel and tell me what you think the answer is. What's two minus five and what's zero minus five? Okay, good. 2 minus 5 is 13. Start at 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 0 minus 5 is 11. We start at 0 and go back by 5. You end up at 11. Good. Now here's three more problems to do. 9 plus 11. 2 plus 11, and 0 plus 11. So three problems, this time we're just adding 11. Good, 9 plus 11 is 4. Mm -hmm. 2 plus 11 is obviously 13. And 0 plus 11, you know, clearly that's 11. Okay, but here's the thing to note. Look at these three answers and these three answers. We got the same answers in all three cases. We got 4, 13, and 11, but we were doing different operations. For the first three, we were doing minus 5, and for the second three, we were doing plus 11. And we get the same answers. So what that means is that subtracting 5 and adding 11 are really the same operation.
And what we can kind of conclude from that is that negative 5 is equal to positive 11. So if I subtract 5 and I arrive at an answer, and I add 11 and I arrive at the same answer, it means that those two numbers, negative 5 and 11, are equal to each other. Well, that seems strange, but let's see what happens here. So 11 here on the wheel and negative 5 must occupy the same spot on the wheel if they're going to be equal to each other. Let me, I, I, got an, I got the wheel again on this slide over here. So negative 5 and 11 occupy the same spot on the wheel. Well, if, if this is negative 5, then uh, this one here is probably negative 4. And 13 is negative 3. And we can verify all this by showing that if we subtract 3 from a number or add 13 to the number, we end up in the same spot. 14 is negative 2 and 15 is negative 1. So what we're doing here is we're taking this wheel that has 16 numbers on it and we're reassigning some of the numbers to be negatives. Or we're saying that some of the positive numbers have equivalent negative values. 11 positive is equivalent to negative 5 and 12 is equivalent to negative 4. So all we're doing is we're taking some of the positive values and then just reassigning them negative equivalent values. And it's kind of convenient to break that wheel in half so that half the numbers are positive and half are negative. So here's the dividing spot between positive and negative. So on this side of the wheel is positive and on this side of the wheel is negative. So where does this, uh, where does this line go? Like, you know, when it goes across the wheel, um, where does it end up? That's why I'm trying to figure that out. Max has pointed out that negative 5 and 11 have a difference of 16. So they're exactly 16 apart on the number line, which is the number of values we have on the wheel. Same thing for negative 4 and 12. Those are also 16 apart. So if we were to extend this dotted line downward, it would end up between the 8 and the 7. Stuff on the right-hand side of the wheel is positive, and stuff on the left-hand side of the wheel is negative. That means that, negative, uh, that the value of 10 must have the value negative 6, and 9 is negative 7, and 8 is also negative 8. So if we are to say that everything on the left-hand side are the negative numbers. Then we go from negative 1 to negative 8. And if we say the right-hand side are the positive numbers, we've got them right here. So 0 through 7. So let's, let's try, well, <clears throat> before we do that, what I've done here by splitting this wheel in half and then reassigning half of the numbers to become negative numbers, this is actually what two's complement is. Two's complement takes the range of values <clears throat> and reassigns half of them to be negative numbers. 
So the lower half, the numbers that come first from zero up to half of our range, remain positive numbers, and everything in the upper range, the upper half, become negative numbers. And so if this is the two's complement representation for negative numbers, it means that we ought to be able to do that invert and add thing and uh, arrive at the same answers. So let's, let's go ahead and try that. So I want to calculate what negative 5 is. So I know positive 5 is right here on my wheel. It's 0, 1, 0, 1. And negative 5 is over here on the wheel, and its representation is 1, 0, 1, 1. But let's see if that flip and add thing works. So I'm going to convert positive 5 to negative 5. So 5 is 0, 1, 0, 1. Then I'm going to invert. 1, 0, 1, 0. And then add 1 to that. And I get 1, 0, 1, 1. And that's right here on the wheel. 1, 0, 1, 1. Its positive value is 11, but we've assigned it to be the value negative 5. We can do that for any of the numbers on the wheel. We can take the positive value, do the flip and add thing, and we'll end up with the negative value. And the same thing works for the negative numbers. Let's start with 11, or negative 5. Then we'll invert 0, 1, 0, 0, and then add. And we get 1, 0, 1, 0 from the right. And that took us from negative 5 over to 5. And by the way, for those of you who kind of like to see pictures, um, when you do the invert and add thing or you find the negative, you're not going to the opposite side of the wheel. <laughs> what you're doing is you're going straight across. So negative uh, 1 is over here, and negative 1 is straight across. Straight across meaning like, like actually horizontally across. Okay, so that's what two's complement is. You're just taking this number wheel and the numbers that are on the lower half of the wheel <coughs> stay positive numbers and the numbers that are on the upper half of the wheel become negative numbers. And that's why when you're looking at the bit values for a negative number in two's complement that most significant bit is actually a one. You kind of think if you if someone was like planning this out they make it so that the one was positive and the zero was negative um, because the negative numbers come before the positive numbers on the number line right you've got a number line negative numbers are over here positive numbers are over here and so you'd think in numeric order the negative numbers would come first but in two's complement it's actually swapped around the positive numbers comes um, come first and then the negative numbers come after them on the number line. But I want to emphasize that this picture that I drew with the number wheel is really kind of what two's complement is. It's just um, reassigning half the numbers to be negative. The whole invert and add thing, that's just an algorithm, a series of steps to follow to convert one to the other, convert positive to negative. So the definition of two's complement isn't really, I mean, isn't really the whole invert and add thing. It's the, it's the uh, reassigning half the numbers to be positive and half to be negative. So 
um, what am I trying to say? It's easy to think of two's complement as being uh, defined by the algorithm, but actually the algorithm is just how you solve the problem. The concept is half the numbers are negative and half are positive. Okay, so, so that's two's complement, the textbook you're reading, plus many websites and YouTube videos go over two's complement representation and how to do the computations with the invert and add thing. Um, but really wanted to, wanted to show you was what's going on behind the scenes. Like what's, what does it really look like? And I want you to have that wheel model in your mind because that wheel model is going to come up not only for um, representing negative numbers, but it's going to come up again and again as we go through the first half of this semester. So let's, let's switch gears a little bit. If uh, somebody showed you these sequences of ones and zeros, these bits, and asked you, what is this? What would you say? A very large number. All right. Um, so you say it's a, a very large number. Like, could we calculate what it is? Someone here says, yes, of course we can calculate what it is. Um, <clears throat> but maybe one question to ask is, is this a positive number or a negative number? We don't know without the context. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Trying to link in with what we said last week. Without some context, we don't know what this actually is. Is this a, um, an unsigned, very large positive number? Or is this a slightly smaller uh, negative number in two's complement representation? So is it signed, unsigned? Is it actually a, a sound? Is it some Unicode characters? Is it part of an image? Um, like you said, we decimal have, too. could it be a floating point number? Without being told what, the, uh, what kind of representation this number is, we just simply don't know. Now, as far as the signed or unsigned question, um, well, first of all, we don't know, um, but, it, but it may be um, something of a curiosity to you that some languages, some programming languages, support the idea that numbers can be only positive. For example, in Java, if I say int, x equals 5. <clears throat> well, in Java, an integer is defined to be a signed number. So being a 32-bit quantity, its ranges, it can range from approximately negative 2 billion or so up to positive 2 billion for a, range, a total range of about 4 billion values. And in C or C++, if you just say int x equals 5, you'll get a assigned number. But you can also say unsigned int x equals 5. And now it will treat x as an unsigned number. It won't do 2's complement. And so the total range of values is still 4 billion values, but it goes from 0 up to about 4 billion. So you've still got 32 bits of values. Still got 4 billion possible values. But in C and C++, you can say those 32 bits are an unsigned, or you can say they're a signed quantity, and then it just treats the number differently. 
It's the same 32 bits, but with the context now of it being either a signed or unsigned quantity. So Java doesn't support this at all. In Java, numbers are always signed, but in C or C++, they could be unsigned as well. Anyway, getting back to this idea that um, positive numbers and negative numbers have equivalent values. <clears throat> Notice, uh, what was it? it was back on this, whoops, this slide over here, where we said that adding 11 and subtracting 5 were really the same operation. And so that's actually what goes on inside of a computer. If you want to subtract a number from another number, the computer doesn't actually do the subtraction. What it does instead is compute the negative of the number you want to try to subtract and then just simply adds them. In other words, um, subtracting 5 from a number is the same as adding uh, negative 5, right? <laughs> Which means positive 11. Uh, what I'm trying to get to there is that Inside of a CPU, inside of the actual chip itself, there is no actual circuitry to do subtraction. There is only negation and addition. So in two's complement arithmetic, subtraction and addition are the same operation. This uh, chip over here is the Intel 4004. It was the first microprocessor ever put onto an individual little chip. Uh, I think it's back in the 1970s. It was a four bit processor, <laughs> you can imagine. So, uh, four bit arithmetic was all that it did. Um, and as such, it didn't need very many pins going com coming out of it because you only had four, four data pins coming out. <clears throat> this, this actual chip. Um, it's very, very rare. I don't actually have one. It's a picture I found on the internet. Um, but what somebody did was they basically opened up the chip. They took off that gold um, lid on it and then looked at the, at the silicon inside and then took a picture of it. That's what you see over on the right-hand side. And it's very hard to see what's uh, written on these um, diagrams. But right here, I'm going to highlight it in red, right here, It's labeled adder. So this is the actual circuitry inside the CPU that performs the addition operation. But nowhere in here. There's some stuff in here for carry. There's some stuff in here for accumulator. That's your registers. You've got uh, the carry um, over here as well. Uh, what else we got here? Adder control. So this is also part of the adder right here. And command register, timing and synchronization. But if you look all over, you'll, you won't find any section of there labeled subtractor. And that's because there isn't one. There's only an adder. And if you want to subtract, you just simply negate the number and then add. So this is a very powerful concept for computers because it means you don't have to set aside separate areas of the silicon to implement this other operation. If you have negation and you have addition, you can do subtraction. That's what actually happens inside of a computer. So somewhere in here, there's probably an area dedicated to doing um, inversion. So just taking all the bits and flipping them from zero to one and one to zero. And then uh, you can simply do the, 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 you can simulate adding one by doing something with the carry over here. So uh, adding one is really just like bringing in a carry from a previous operation that does it, uh, has the effect of adding one. So if, if you want to subtract, you just simply invert all the bits and then you bring in a carry and then that adds one for you. Okay, um, 
that's kind of like my wrap up for talking about two's complement. You've got the algorithm for converting positive to negative and negative to positive. Two's complement is by far the most common way to represent positive and negative numbers inside of a computer. Uh, when you when you set aside a variable like you know int x equals five, then it sets aside 32 bits for that number, and it assumes it is a two's complement number, which means uh, if you want to convert it to a negative, you do the flip and add thing. And when you want to print it out on the screen, you're going to treat the bits. You're going to look at that most significant bit and see whether it's positive or negative. If it's positive, if it's a zero, then you just read off the values of the remaining bits and then display your number. Um, if it's a negative, if that bit over there is a one, then you're going to do the whole flip and add thing. Find the positive value, display that number, and then just put a minus sign in front. So I want to switch gears for a little bit and talk briefly about another representation called sine magnitude. Now sine magnitude is the way that we humans do it. We just take a number like 37 and if we want to make it negative we just change the sign in front. The 37 stays the same. We just flip the sign from no sign or a plus to a minus. And if we want to take a negative and make it positive. If you want to take negative 37 and make it positive, you just change the sign in front. So you got the sign and you've got the magnitude of the number. The magnitude is like how far away from the zero it is on the, on the number line. So in sign magnitude representation, the most significant bit is still the sign. One still stands for negative and the zero still stands for positive. <clears throat> this number here is a negative number, which we know because the most significant bit is a 1. And then this here, the remaining 7 bits are the magnitude. And so this number is negative. And then if we add up the bits here, we get 1 plus 4 plus 32 is, oh, 37, negative 37. Then number two, this is a positive number. Here's our magnitude. If you look at this, you can see it's the same bit sequence as the one above. So this number here must be positive 37. And so you try to figure out what is number three. Good. It's a hundred. Positive a hundred. The sign is zero, so this is positive, and then the magnitude of the number is just a hundred. Well, the question might be, why don't we just use this in the computers? Why don't we do a little complicated, like, flip and add thing? Why don't we just use this? Well, Turns out the arithmetic is all wonky. <laughs> Let's try doing negative 37 plus 37. So we know what those bit values are. Let's see what happens when we add them together. One zero one zero zero one zero one. That's just this one here, and then here's positive 37. We'll bring that over, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then we'll add those together. Now, if this is a good representation for numbers, we ought to get 0 out of this. Starting from the right-hand side, we got 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. In the next column we got 0, carry the 1, and then a 1, and then 0, 0, carry the 1, 1, 1. 
and that is not zero. It's a negative number, which we can tell because the sign is one and is clearly not zero. So it turns out sine magnitude doesn't work so well for doing arithmetic. And then you may be wondering, well, how do humans do it? Like, how, how are humans able to do sine magnitude calculations so easily? And the answer is, well, we've been trained for it for years and years. Sometime in elementary school, you start learning the rules for dealing with negative numbers. If I want to do negative 37 plus 100, you'll have to learn that that's not the problem you should actually solve. You should take that problem and convert it into 100 minus 37. So you take the two operands and you switch them around. You go, okay, that's one rule. How about 100 minus negative 37? Well, you got a different rule for that. <laughs> the rule there says, uh, if you're subtracting a negative number, you should turn it into addition of positive numbers. Well, what about 100 plus negative 37? Okay, that one has another rule. <clears throat> that one says you should do, actually turn this into a subtraction problem. And then even more wacky, what if we have a negative number and we're subtracting another negative number? Well, then we have to apply two rules to that. First, we have to take those two negatives and make them positive. And then we have to switch the operands around and make it a, minus, make it a subtraction. This is just exhausting. There are so many rules. And when computer, com computers were first created back in the 1940s, they used this representation. Sign magnitude was the representation they used because it was easy for the engineers of the time to just take it the way humans did things and then just create the electric circuits to do the same thing electronically. But they had to implement all those rules. That's crazy. I think there's a total of 16 rules you gotta, you got to memorize. And to make matters worse, what's the range of values that sign magnitude can do? What's the, the, the number that's all the way on the left-hand side? And what's the number that's all the way on the right-hand side? Well, the number that's on the left-hand side is a negative number with the biggest magnitude. So all ones. And that number is negative 127. And the number that's all the way on the right-hand side is a positive number with the biggest magnitude. That's a positive 127. Which gives us a total number of values of 255. If you were to count all the values from negative 127, up to positive 127, you'd get 255. But wait a minute, we have 8 bits. They're supposed to be 256. So where's the missing one? Well, it's right here in the middle. We have 0 in the middle, and we have negative 0. There's two zeros in this representation. So that's another rule that you have to add on. If you get negative zero as your answer, you have to make it positive. So after you've done all your calculations, if you finally end up with negative zero for some reason in your answer, you then have to flip that sign and make it positive. So 
to use complement is clearly superior for doing things like uh, addition and subtraction because you don't have to have a separate subtractor. You just simply convert it to its negative value and then just add. And the, also the cool thing about it is, if you, if you look at that picture of the, the chip over here, I'll show it to you again, there's no separate signed adder and unsigned adder. It's just the same adder for both of them. When you're doing the addition, the adder doesn't have to know whether it's a signed or unsigned number. It just simply adds the columns up, just like we did um, on the screen over here. And then it's the interpretation of the result that tells you whether it's a positive or negative number. So if you are taking two unsigned numbers and adding them together, you'll get an unsigned result. And then when you want to print that out on the screen, you know it's an unsigned number because in your variable declaration you said unsigned int equals you know x plus y. And so you know the answer is going to be unsigned, and so you display it as an unsigned number. You, you don't treat that most significant bit as a signed bit. You just treat it as just another bit. But if you add two signed numbers together, you're going to get a signed result. It could be positive, could be negative. When you want to display the result on the screen, you look at that most significant bit. Now you have some context about whether the answer is signed or unsigned. You look at that most significant bit. If it's a zero, you know the answer is positive. And so you just interpret the rest of the bits as normal. And if there's a one over there, you know the number is negative. So you have to figure out what the positive value is. So you do the flip and add thing. You get the positive number and then you display it with a negative sign in front. So you have, by declaring the type of the variable as being either signed or unsigned, you get some context about how to display that result. And you know how to interpret this pattern of bits. Do you know if there's like a similar algorithm for the decimal number system? Maybe it would be called like tens complement? Oh. Um, you can do subtraction with addition in the uh, decimal yeah, number yes, system? Yes, actually, actually you can. Um, that's an interesting question. Is like, can you, can you do the same thing uh, representing negative numbers using just the numbers 0 through 9. And yes, you absolutely can. Um, what you do is, there's, there's several ways to do it. I actually played around with this one time. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so first thing is you have to do the whole like what, the flip and add thing, right? But flipping in binary is easy. 0 becomes 1 and 1 becomes 0. How do you flip in base 10? Uh, well, the way you flip in base 10 is you just subtract each number from 10. Right, so 1, beca oh, okay. one becomes 9, 2 becomes 8, right? <clears throat> um, and then you do the add 1 at the end. <laughs> and so the add 1 in 2's complement, is that just because when you have 1's complement, mm -hmm. you have like the negative 0 to negative 7. Is that just because we shift the negative number line over by 1? From negative one to negative eight. Uh, essentially, um, two's complement is really. Um, how do I say this here? There's there's one's complement as well. One's complement is basically you just take the bits and you just invert them. Okay, so your positive numbers are just as is, and your negative numbers are just the positive numbers, but all the bits have been flipped. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was yeah. referencing. So that's, that's one's complement. Um, then if you try to add two one's complement numbers together, you'll find your answer will be off by one. And that's why we use and two's complement. And that's it why fixes that yeah, arithmetic that plus error. one fixes that little plus one, fixes that off by one error that you get. All right. Um, so if you add a positive number and a negative number together in one's complement, you'll be off by one. If you add uh, two negative numbers together in, in one's complement, you'll be off by two. But in two's complement, right, you'll, you add one to the first one, and you add one to the second one, and so it removes that error. So you can actually do tens complement. I, I don't think that's a real name, but that's the name I called it. Uh, and so you, you flip all the digits so by subtracting each one from ten, and then you add one, and then you've got your tens complement number. And then 
So, so the, let's say you're using four digits, so your, your range is from <laughs> 0 to 9999. But what you're doing is you're taking half those numbers, the upper half of them, and you're making them negative. So 0 to 4999 are your positive numbers, and then 5000 to 9999 become your negative numbers. And then you can just do your arithmetic. So here's a challenge for you. Next time you have the math homework, do it all in tens complement. Just blow your, <laughs> blow your teacher's mind, right? But it'll work. It, it totally will work. And so, um, you know, when you start playing around with it, you might, you might start thinking, well, um, in twos complement, we just flip the bits, right? Zero becomes one, one becomes zero. But in tens complement, we subtract from ten, so it seems like it's a different operation. But it's not, actually, because in twos complement, we're, another way to express flipping the bit is subtract from two. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Right, right. So if I take two and I subtract, uh, if I take zero and subtract two from it, then does that work? I think it does work. Anyway, two minus one becomes zero, right? And then... Oh, no, no, we're subtracting from 1. Is that right? We're subtracting from 1 to, to flip it, not subtracting from 2. I have to think about this. So that means that when you're doing tens complement, you're actually subtracting from 9. Yeah, I just saw that on Google. It says you subtract from 9. Oh, yeah, so I was, I was off by 1. Yeah, you subtract, you subtract from 9, and that gives you the, the other one. And then you add 1 at the end. So in twos complement, okay, we're, actually, that makes sense. We're, actually subtracting from, we're actually subtracting from 1 to flip the bits. So, so tens complement is a thing? Uh, apparently it's a thing, and there's a lot of people that like experimenting with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can totally do it. Uh, we got a few minutes left, and so let me just show you one more representation, which is called excess n. It's also called excess K or bias. And actually, honestly, this is the easiest one to express, to tell you, but it's the hardest one to get your head around for some reason. <laughs> and so let me set this up for you. So we have three bits that we're using for our numbers here. This, uh, I'm keeping the, the example small. We got three bits. So we've got the numbers 0 through 7. And then up here are the three bit representations for them. But let's say um, my application that I'm doing requires some of those numbers to be negative. Right? I, I don't want to go 0 through 7. I want to go negative 2 to 5. My application requires negative 1 and negative 2 in addition to the positive numbers. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reassign some of those numbers to be negative. And the easiest way to do it, really, is just to slide the number line down by 2. So I'm going to take this number line, 0 to 7, and I'm just going to subtract 2 from each one of them. That's all. I just took my original 0 to 7, and I just slid it over so that now it's negative 2 to 5. And this is called excess 2. All you're doing is you're biasing or subtracting 2 from all the numbers and coming up with a new range. That's it. That's all it is. There's no flip and add. There's no sign bit. It's just simply subtracting a constant 
from each one of the numbers to come up with a new set of numbers. And we can do this in any number of bits. So on the bottom here I have four bits, 0 to 15. But my application needs, let's say, negative 5 to 10. So 0 becomes negative 5, 1 becomes negative 4, 2 becomes negative 3, 3 becomes negative 2, 4 becomes negative 1, 5 becomes 0, 6 becomes 1, and then finally 15 over here becomes 10 and 14 uh, was 9. Okay, so this is called excess 5 or bias 5. All I've done is just taking the number line and just slid it down by five spots. Okay, so if I want to represent the number, uh, let's say, negative 2 in four bits using excess 5, all I have to do is look on this chart. Here's negative 2. Its equivalent value in four bits is the number 3, and so I just write down 0, 0, 1, 1, the value for 3. So negative 2... becomes 3, and this becomes 0, 0, 1, 1. That's all. So you're just um, adding or subtracting a constant from all of the numbers. It's easy, really, but this trips people up the most. Couple more examples. Let's say you saw the bit sequence 1010 zero, one, zero, and we knew this was an excess 5. What number is that actually? Okay, it's not 10. Ten is the number up here. This is the excess 5 representation of what number? Well, we can look on the chart. We can go, well, 7 is 2, 8 is 3, 9 is 4, and 10 must be 5. But the way you calculate that is we just have to add that constant back in. So 1, 0, 1, 0 in base 2 is equal to 10 in base 10. We're going to subtract 5, which is our shift amount, and that gives us 5 as our answer, positive 5. How about 0, 1, 1, 0? Okay, so just convert this to decimal. This is uh, 6. Subtract our constant, which is 5, and we end up with 1. Here's 0, 1, 1, 0, and its equivalent value is 1. Okay, so when you want to convert uh, from a number into its excess 5 representation, you just add 5 to the number. And when I go in reverse, you just subtract 5. That's for excess 5. If you're doing excess 2, you add or subtract 2. What if we're using 8 bits? Well, we have the range now from 0 to 255, so we've got a total of 256 numbers. Let's say my app needs negative 100 to 
155. So that means 0 becomes negative 100, 1 becomes negative 99, 2 becomes negative 98, 3 is negative 97, and so forth, and then 255 gets the value of 155. So this is excess 100. So this number over here just simply tells you what your constant shift amount is. So if my application needs the number negative 37, but I want to represent that in binary using excess 100, I just simply add, 30, uh, add 100 to that number. So negative 37 becomes uh, 63. And then I just write down 63 in binary, and there we go. That's it. And then if I have that bit sequence, I think it's a zero, zero, then a bunch of ones. I convert that into 63, subtract 100, and I get negative 37. So I'll end with this. Typically, I'll almost end with this. Um, but typically, in, uh, when you're using excess n, you want to assign half the numbers to be positive and half to be negative, just to break it in half nicely. Uh, but there's two ways to break this number line in half. We have 256 numbers, and so we could either do negative 127 to 128, or we could do negative 128 to positive 127. The first one is called excess 127, and the second one is called excess 128 just two ways to break it in half. Neither one of them is more correct than another. There's just two ways to do it. Okay, so we've got three ways of doing signed integers. We've got sign magnitude, which is not used much these days, but actually still kind of is in some, in some limited ways. We have two's complement, which is the, by far the most common way to do it because it works out nice mathematically. And then finally we have this uh, excess n, which is also used in, a, in some very limited places. That's why I wanted to show you about those three, is because two's complement is the most common one, but these other two are also used in some places. And where they get used is what we'll talk about next time. Floating point numbers. Floating point numbers, and this is just a little preview, floating point numbers are essentially scientific notation, but in binary. If I have a number like negative 368.92, I could convert that into a normalized scientific notation by sliding this decimal place over by 2, and I get negative 3.6892 times 10 to the 2 power. Probably done that in some of your science classes. Taking a, a decimal fractional number and normalizing it into scientific by sliding that decimal place either to the left or to the right so that there's one digit in front and then just changing the exponent. So in a number like this, we have three important parts. We've got the sign in front, this piece in the middle is called the mantissa. And then on the back, we have the exponent. The times 10, um, we don't actually need to represent that because that's not really an important piece of a scientific notation number. Everyone knows it's times 10. Right? So the pieces that we do need to know are the mantissa, whether it's a positive or negative number, and the exponent. And so you can kind of think of this first piece here as being in sine magnitude. And the exponent piece is done in excess n. We're going to study floating point numbers next time, and we're going to see how all three of these pieces come together 
to represent a huge range of values using a very small number of bits. So like we can represent values going up you know, into the uh, hundreds of exponents and down to the negative hundreds of exponents using just say 16 bits um, or 32 bits. Um, and it gives you, gives you a huge range of values at the expense of some loss of precision. We'll go over that next time. So ultimately what I'm trying to show you here is that given a fixed bit, a sequence of ones and zeros, we can interpret that sequence as being either signed numbers, unsigned numbers, floating point numbers, potentially as images, sounds, just about anything we want. Uh, if we have the context of how the, what that representation is, then we can use that to interpret that sequence of bits and figure out what they actually mean. But again, uh, floating point numbers are just how do we represent this huge range of values given that all we have is a fixed number of ones and zeros. Okay, whew, that, that's it for today. We filled up the whole hour and a half. Um, any questions on that stuff? You're going to go and try that uh, tens complement thing, aren't you? I would, but I'm pretty busy this week. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That'd be something just to play around with. Okay. Um, well, that's it for today. Hope you got something out of that. I know it was a lot to throw at you. Um, maybe you've seen the twos complement stuff before, but uh, uh, for some of you, hopefully it was nice to see that wheel uh, representation of two's complement and say that's what's really going on behind the scenes, not this whole flip and add thing. Next time we'll talk about the wheel. Definitely made it easier. Yeah. <laughs> to think uh, when of. we get into modular arithmetic, we're going to see that wheel again, and that's going to lead us into cryptography. So keep that wheel in mind. And I might also explain why if you write if you've ever written like a Java or C program and you've got your integer and you just start adding to that integer or multiplying it, um, at some point those numbers seem to go to negative. And that's because you just crossed over the top of that wheel and went from positive territory to negative territory. Or you went the other direction. You started with a negative number and then suddenly it became positive for some reason. It's because again, you crossed over from one side to the other side. Same thing can happen on the bottom side. You, you start adding numbers and suddenly they become negative. So either you cross over that threshold on the bottom or you cross over that threshold on the top. So there's two thresholds for modular? Um, no, for the, for the two's complement numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So your big, your big positive numbers can suddenly become negative numbers if you cross over this way. And your small positive numbers can suddenly become negative numbers if you cross over that way or the other way around. Oh, yeah, I see. So have you seen that in your programs? Yeah, I have. Yeah. It's really kind of disconcerting the first time you see that. Uh, but once you understand what's going on, it makes perfect sense. And that's uh, one of the limitations of, of programming languages, which is all, all of their sort of integer types have this fixed range. And there's no way for your programming language to know if that happened, if you crossed over. It just simply becomes a negative. And there's nothing in your program that says, whoa, something weird happened there. Yeah, it's like the whole Gangnam Style YouTube video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but if you're doing this in assembly language, if you, if you cross over from there to there, from, from negative to positive, what will happen is an overflow will get generated. And then your assembly language program can get access to that. Say, whoa, an overflow happened. Something, something weird happened with my numbers. Um, but most programming languages don't give you that sort of low-level access to that overflow bit to let you know that that happened. And so it just silently changes signs. Okay, uh, I think that's it for today. I have my student hours now, so if you want to come and talk to me about any questions you have about the course or anything else about the homework or the way the course is structured, then switch over the Zoom sessions to that one. If not, I will see you on uh, Wednesday. We'll talk about the floating point numbers. 
And some of you are also in my C programming class on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That'll be at 9.30, and we're starting to talk about um, functions, and, and we're continuing with our loops and, and conditionals, and we'll start uh, writing more complex programs. Okay, so I will see you all either tomorrow or Wednesday. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. And the YouTube folks, looks like we had no more than three or four people. But I think a lot of you will be back on Tuesday and Thursday for the C programming class. So I will see you all then. And I hope you all have a good day as well. Bye-bye.